Now for our top story tonight, which comes from Russia, where President Vladimir Putin claims that his country has developed a new cruise missile that is invincible. Those are his words. In his annual State of the Nation address in Moscow, the Russian president said that they've tested nuclear weapons, including a nuclear-powered cruise missile and a nuclear-powered underwater drone that will be immune to enemy intercept. Basically, what he's saying is that all the missile defense systems that America has installed all over the world will now be useless. They will not be able to stop the new Russian nukes. That's not all. Putin claims that these weapons can reach anywhere in the world. Their range is unlimited. Through a video presentation, Putin highlighted two nuclear-capable weapons, a cruise missile and a submarine-launched unmanned underwater vehicle or an underwater drone. Vladimir Putin said that the warhead was a low-flying cruise missile, which would be difficult to spot. It has a nuclear payload with a practically unlimited range and an unpredictable flight path. The weapon can bypass lines of interception and is invincible in the face of all existing and future systems of both missile defense and air defense. Throughout his speech, the Russian president made it clear that the focus of the new weapon system was America. He said Russia has acted in response to the U.S. withdrawing from the Treaty on Anti-Ballistic Weapons. He also said that any use of nuclear weapons against Russia or its allies would be considered an attack on Moscow. Joining us uh, this evening is our correspondent from Moscow, Julia Chapman. Uh, good evening, Julia. What we know about this weapon is what the Russian president has told the world. Is there any way to independently verify these claims and how powerful is, these, is this weapon? Um, no, we only really have President Putin's word, um, and he did talk about them at length with, uh, as you said, uh, video and animation descriptions. Uh, particularly interesting were these two weapons uh, that were nuclear capable, uh, the underwater drone that uh, had a nuclear capability, as well as the inter uh, in uh, excuse me, uh, international ballistic missile that could go anywhere in the world. Um, and he did uh, talk about these at length um, with these visual aids and did specifically speak about the, um, the West not being open to dialogue with Russia about nuclear capabilities um, and that he said this was a response to that and that any uh, threat to Russia's allies would indeed be seen as a threat to uh, Moscow itself and would be acted on accordingly with these weapons that have been in development. What's the immediate provocation for Russia to have developed and more importantly to have announced that it is, is in possession of such a weapon? What explains the hawkish tone that Vladimir Putin took today? Yeah, well, there's a couple of explanations for that. One, of course, is the timing. This speech was, in fact, moved back from December to today. Um, and that's quite significant because it comes just two and a half weeks before the presidential election. President Putin is, of course, expected widely to comfortably win his fourth term as Russia's president. But it doesn't hurt to uh, give a little bit of rhetoric ahead of that. And this was, in fact, one of the first times he'd really set out his stall ahead of the election. He hasn't been doing very much campaigning thus far. Um, he spent most of the first half of the speech talking about domestic economic issues and then uh, very quickly shifted tone to this uh, defense range that Russia has been developing. So the timing about uh, the ahead of the election is quite significant. Russians do tend to, uh, Russian voters tend to respond uh, fairly well to um, these kind of rhetoric, uh, this kind of rhetoric from Vladimir Putin ahead of elections. In fact, it was very well received um, amongst the audience uh, at the speech itself. He got standing ovations all round. Um, it was a very nationalistic kind of, um, you know, pro-Russia event, and he he did get a lot of good response from that. The other uh, timing uh, factor, of course, is that um, he's been responding to a lot of rhetoric from uh, the U.S. and from U.S. President um, Donald Trump who has been um, speaking a lot, of course, lately about uh, the U.S. nuclear uh, capabilities. Um, in fact, Putin addressed that specifically, saying he didn't like the tone that was coming out of the U.S., um, and, and he said that this was a direct result of that, this development. Julia Chapman, thanks very much. Appreciate you joining us here from Moscow this evening. Let's play out for our viewers what the Russian president had to say in that address today. Создание перспективного ракетного комплекса стратегического назначения с принципиально новым боевым оснащением, планирующим крылатым блоком, испытания которого также успешно завершены. Существенные результаты достигнуты в создании лазерного оружия. И это уже не просто теория или проекты, и даже не просто начало производства. 
С прошлого года в войска уже поступают боевые лазерные комплексы. So this is what the Russian president essentially has said, that the world will now have to take notice of what Russia is saying, what Russia is doing. The world has ignored Russia long enough, not anymore. He has weapons to conquer the world. He has weapons which, in his own words, are invincible. He has nuclear weapons, both underwater and ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which can target any place, anywhere in the world, and will not be intercepted or detected by missile defense systems that America has installed. It's a provocation. Uh, that's how many in the West are seeing it. Remember, the NATO has called it Satan II. And uh, this comes at a very, very important time, as Julia Chapman just pointed out. This is just two and a half weeks before the presidential election, an election that, that uh, Vladimir Putin is expected to win comfortably. He has virtually no political challenger. And yet, this rhetoric, this positioning, this statement buttresses his tough leader image and that's something that every politician can use uh, let's look at the reactions uh, and washington america of course was was the target as many saw it of vladimir putin's speech so let's go straight to washington uh, we on correspondent harry horton joining us from there good evening harry putin did not mince his words his message and his warning was very very clear it was directed largely at america has washington reacted to it yet Well, we haven't had any official reaction yet in Washington from either at the White House or the Pentagon, but I'm sure that U.S. officials here in the government will view uh, this new nuclear threat from Russia as being pretty credible. And the context of this uh, is that uh, last month the U.S. announced its own review of its nuclear capabilities. That followed a, a year-long uh, review ordered by the President Donald Trump. Uh, the President Donald Trump said a year ago that he wanted to see uh, a nuclear arsenal so strong and powerful that it would deter any acts of aggression. Uh, and this review that was carried out by the Pentagon was called the Nuclear Posture Review. Uh, and in that document, uh, it particularly highlighted the need for the U.S. to counter the strategic threats posed by Beijing and, and in particular Moscow. The document, and I'll quote from it now, said our strategy will ensure Russia understands that any use of nuclear weapons, however limited, uh, is unacceptable. So uh, the U.S. in the past month launching its own uh, enhanced uh, nuclear program uh, and Russia uh, seemingly responding to that uh, today with this announcement from Vladimir Putin. So certainly these enhanced nuclear capabilities on both sides, uh, I think, will raise tensions uh, in the world uh, about the state of nuclear weapons at the moment. Indeed. Uh, the NATO has called it Satan II. Russia claims that America's withdrawal from the treaty on anti-ballistic weapons forced Moscow to develop such nukes. How much water does that argument hold? Uh, well, look, I, 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 you know, within Washington, another one of the reasons for carrying out this uh, nuclear posture review uh, was the theory that Russia doesn't view uh, the U.S.'s nuclear capabilities at the moment as being very strong. So uh, this year-long review carried out by the Pentagon uh, and this, this big document that was uh, uh, launched showing that the U.S. was prepared to enhance its nuclear weapons was, uh, in effect, a message to Moscow to say, look, we are uh, uh, pretty capable of, of launching uh, a, a nuclear attack, so, so you need to watch out. So, look, uh, certainly uh, uh, clear that, that there are tensions between the two sides. I'm not sure whether we will get a reaction from President Donald Trump uh, in Washington uh, over the course of the uh, next 24 hours or so. Of course, he has responded to nuclear threats in the past before, uh, infamously, uh, of course, with Kim Jong-un of North Korea, where he boasted that the U.S.'s nuclear button was bigger than that of North Korea and the U.S.'s nuclear button worked. Uh, so uh, certainly it's within uh, the nature of Donald Trump to respond to these sorts of threats. But whether or not he'll be given the airtime uh, to uh, make that sort of announcement, we'll have to wait and see. Very quickly, and my final question to you, Harry, this comes even as the Russia meddling probe has picked pace in America. How do Americans see this posturing by Vladimir Putin? Is he still seen as Donald Trump's friend? Well, well, he's seen by uh, Americans in very different ways. I, you know, I, I think certainly the warm rhetoric that Donald Trump espouses about Vladimir Putin 
still continues to surprise people here in the United States. But then the military postures from the U.S. towards Russia have been very different. We saw that with this nuclear posture review, the U.S. specifically talking about the threat from Moscow. Uh, so, so we're seeing very different rhetoric from the president and from the White House uh, to what we're seeing from the U.S. military and the generals in the Pentagon. Harry Horton, thanks very much for joining us here from Washington. Uh, as the world leaders indulge in this stuff posturing in arms race, it's worth dwelling on a speech that was made today. A very important speech coming at a very, very important time. The King of Jordan, Abdullah II, is visiting India. He's the direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad and he has emerged as a very strong proponent of moderate Islam. Today he spoke about de-radicalization, about fighting terrorism and misconceptions about his religion, Islam. Listen in. Too much of what's heard in the news or seen online about religion today is all about what separates people. Around the world, suspicions are inflamed by what different groups don't know about others. And such ideologies of hate distort the word of God to stir up conflict and justify crimes and terror. And we need to take these dangers seriously. But they should never be allowed to distract us from the truth. That faith should draw humanity together. It is faith that brings us the golden commandments. Commandments held in common by multiple world religions. To love God, and the good and love our neighbor. It is faith that inspires the everyday experiences of people in countries like India and Jordan, where different religious and ethnic groups have lived and worked together in amity throughout history. It is faith that allows us to prosper and thrive, bringing together different civilizations and cultures around the common principles of humanity. So my friends, where did human diversity begin? God Almighty says in the Holy Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, people we created you from a single pair of male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other. The most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. To understand each other, to recognize our shared humanity, to act righteously in the sight of God. This is my faith, the faith I teach my children, the faith shared by 1.8 billion Muslims around the world. A quarter of humanity. This is traditional, tolerant, plural, and madhab-based Islam, dedicated to the love of God, following the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and seeking to live in virtue and treat others with justice and kindness. Every day when I was growing up, I heard among the names of God, the compassionate, the all-merciful. Every day I heard the greeting, Assalamu alaikum, the blessings of peace. Every day I learned that it was a Muslim's duty to defend the defenseless and help those in need. Every day I was taught my family's Muslim heritage, the heritage that strengthens me in fulfilling my sacred duty today towards my people, my country, and as a Hashemite custodian of Jerusalem's Islamic and Christian holy sites. A hundred years ago, 
my great great grandfather Sharif Hussain bin Ali, who had launched the Great Arab Revolt, was asked to help Christian refugees fleeing into the Arab world. <laughs> Families with their meager belongings escaping persecution in their old homelands. And the Sharif instructed his sons, emirs of Arab countries, and other local leaders to protect these strangers in the same way you would protect yourselves, your properties, your children. India's Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, also spoke about inclusiveness and diversity and how those who spread terror in the name of religion do it the biggest disservice. Listen in. Indian democracy is a celebration of our age-old plurality. यह वो शक्ति है जिसके बल पर हर भारतीय के मन में आपने गौरवशाली अतीत के प्रति आदर है, वर्तमान के प्रति विश्वास है और भविष्य पर भरोसा है। फ्रेंड्स हमारी परंपरा की समृद्ध विविधता हमें वह संबल देती है जो आज के अनिश्चितता और आशंका से भरे विश्व में और हिंसा और द्वेष से प्रदूषित संसार में आतंकवाद और उग्रवाद जैसी चुनौतियों से लड़ने के लिए यह बेहद जरूरी है हमारी यह विरासत और मूल्य हमारे मजहबों का पैगाम और उनके उसूल वह ताकत है जिनके बल पर हम हिंसा और दहशतगर्दी जैसी चुनौतियों से पार पा सकते हैं फ्रेंड्स इंसानियत के खिलाफ दरिंदगी का हमला करने वाले शायद यह नहीं समझते कि नुकसान उस मजहब का होता है जिसके लिए खड़े होने का वो दावा करते हैं आतंकवाद और उग्रवाद के खिलाफ रेडिकलाइजेशन के खिलाफ मुहिम किसी पंथ के खिलाफ नहीं है यह उस मानसिकता के खिलाफ है जो हमारे युवाओं को गुमराह करके मासूमों पर जुल्म करने के लिए his Hindu nationalist credentials have not stopped Prime Minister Narendra Modi from reaching out to India's Muslim neighbors, whether Bangladesh in June 2015 or five Central Asian states in July this year. That year, rather. But it was really this visit, his visit to the United Arab Emirates the very next month, which set the tone. Although the UAE is on India's doorstep and has been home to over two million Indians, no Prime Minister from this country had seen fit to go there in 34 years. Why? It's not clear. It was one of those aberrations in Indian foreign policy that Prime Minister Modi, to his credit, has worked hard to overcome. Many will recall his Christmas Day visit to Lahore the same year, flying in from Kabul on what was deemed a working visit. Over the span of some hours, he rubbed shoulders with then Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's family and was able to spend some quiet time with him discussing bilateral relations. Ties subsequently went south can be attributed to the internal political dynamics in Pakistan with the army unwilling to tolerate any deviation from its policy where India remains public enemy number one. The next year, 2016, marked another burst of West Asia diplomacy. Modi was in Saudi Arabia in April with his agenda focused on energy, security and well-being of Indian workers. He secured Saudi cooperation on terrorism and walked away with that nation's highest civilian honor named after King Abdul Aziz. From Jeddah, it was Tehran, where he focused on connectivity and infrastructure and, of course, the energy partnership with Iran. The success of that effort is visible today in the operationalization of the Chabahar port. In the process, India was able to circumvent Pakistan, blocking direct trade with Afghanistan. On a short working visit to Herat, the Prime Minister inaugurated the Salma Dam 
designed, funded and built by India. 2017 saw Modi heavily focused on Germany, Russia and France, followed by the first meeting with Donald Trump in the White House. But in the first two months of this year, the Prime Minister has underscored traditional ties with Palestine and made a second visit to the UAE where he oversaw the signing of a clutch of economic agreements, including a 10% stake for Indian companies in an oil concession cooperation in railways and a multimodal logistics park and a hub in Jammu comprising warehouses for specialized storage solutions. Modi's visit hopefully underscores another point that long gaps between visits do little to energize a relationship. While the internet and social media have made the world smaller, a handshake or a hug with a foreign leader is powerful symbolism. It impacts both countries. It builds confidence. It shows that India is committed and cares and builds economic and political relations at a time of global uncertainty. If we talk specifically about Jordan, this was their second meeting in less than three weeks. King Abdullah and Prime Minister Modi. They signed a slew of pacts in diverse areas ranging from defense and security to mass media and agriculture. Take a look. A highlight of King Abdullah's talks with Prime Minister Modi was the signing of a memorandum of understanding on defense cooperation. It includes counter-terrorism and cyber security. India and Jordan held the maiden bilateral security dialogue in July 2016. The second meeting will take place this year. Eleven other MOUs or agreements were signed, including an MOU for long-term import of phosphates from Jordan. Phosphates are a key raw material for fertilizers. And an agreement between the municipalities of Petra in Jordan and Agra in India. Ramesh Ramachandran, we on.